In my dream, I saw myself lying in an old engine room, connected by wires with all the machines. And the room was connected with other rooms, forming a giant building that I never left in my dream. And the building was full of people. But I also saw rooms and halls filled with plants and animals. But most of all, I saw machines in the building. Old ones and new ones. Familiar ones and strange ones. Even seemingly senseless ones. In the basement, I saw machines creating other machines. And below them, down under, I recognized machine men. Or were they man machines? The people spoke to me in many languages, but the machines spoke also. And I understood them all, for they spoke the language of dreams. Machine dreams. Recruits first come to boot camp, they're brought in to the recruit training area at night when it, so they don't know where they are, they're driven around the base so they're disoriented and then they're brought to a receiving barracks where they meet some temporary drone instructors that take them to certain appointments like to get their hair cut. That's one of the main things that takes, strips their individuality away from them when they first arrive. They're disoriented so they're, they're, they're upset, they're, they're worried about what's going to happen next, then they get all their hair cut off. Then they're given different uniforms, they're taking all their civilian clothes away, put in a paper bag and stored away, and they're given the same uniforms, so they all look identical, and their motivation is at the lowest point it could be. And then after a couple days of the basic uh, initial administrative work, then they're brought to their, their regular platoon, that's where their regular drill instructors that are going to train them, pick them up. And that's when they begin to, to train them as a unit or as a machine. In my dream, I saw how God took a piece of clay and put it on one of the first machines, the potter's wheel, and formed from it the first robot. And he brought him to life with his divine breath and called him man. And he created him in his own image as an artificial God. And the artificial God, man, soon dreamed of becoming a real God and he created many machines in his own image, which combined were supposed to become an artificial man. And he worked on this project for thousands of years. Man created two kinds of machines. One as an extension of his body with arms and legs, muscles and joints. And he let them work for him. The other machine was to be the extension of his brain. But it was much more difficult to construct, since the work of the brain is done in the dark. So he improvised for ages with the ritual, the oldest thinking machine. That was his memory. Some invented new machines. Others, like Jeremy Bentham,
tried to improve the artificial god. Bentham's remains are guarded by Professor Frederick Rosen. Bentham was born in 1748 and lived a very long life, dying in 1832, just on the eve of the great reform bill, which he advocated and helped, uh, uh, and helped to work to see its realization. He can be remembered as an important figure in many fields, in education, economics, jurisprudence, politics, and social policy and administration. In philosophy, Bentham is regarded as the founder of utilitarianism, a philosophical doctrine which holds that the object of uh, legislation is to create the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people who make up a society. And this happiness is measured ultimately in terms of pleasure and the absence of pain on the part of individuals. In my dream, I was like the child that learns to distinguish the inner from the outer world. The child learns that every perception that can be made to disappear by moving a muscle must come from outside. And if the closing of eyes or ears or the change of position fails to remove the perception, then it must come from inside. this way, I not only learn to distinguish, but also to control the outer world. And so it dawned on me to project my inner perceptions, my fears and wishes, to the outside, in order to control them too. Thus the love of machines came about, in which we project our inner wishes and desires, but also our fears and anxieties. And the machines promptly and obediently promise to satisfy these wishes and fears. In one of the studios of my building, I mean, I Jim Whiting really builds his I'm unnatural bodies. First things I ever made was a, was a, a, a fairground. I tried to make a fair, fairground ride home because I'd just been to the fairground with a girl uh, who was looking after me, she was about, she was much older than me, she was about 14 I think, and uh, I was only five and I fell in love with her, you see, and uh, when I got back home I, I had to try and recreate the atmosphere and I tried really hard to build a funfair piece, um, a, a rocket that we sat in, and you know, that, that sort of thing, There's the idea of prolonging something by making it, I think was the first motivation to make things and then um, after that I was just I was always interested in making things work but always making everything I wasn't interested in, in, in buying something that worked I wanted to make it I wanted to follow the control right through from the, the, the battery or wherever it was right through to the motor and what it was doing I wanted to make everything I wanted to you know get right in there and create it mm. I never wanted to buy things I never had toys that were never had a electric trains or anything like that, they always made everything. But then, you know, I went to college, and I uh, went to school at college, and I stopped making all that completely because, uh, you know, um, there was pressure on me to do well. And years after leaving college, you know, I tried to do lots of different jobs and things, I could never get a job because I knew deep down that that would be, it. to me, that was like death, you know, to subordinate myself to something that wasn't that didn't have any reason, you know, that I wasn't interested in, that was like, what was the point in living, you know. Besides being stripped of all his individuality, he's told that he can't refer to himself as I, me, 
or the platoon is we, it's always the private. He refers to himself as the private. And he never refers to a drill instructor as you. He doesn't say, well, sir, I thought you said to, he always says, sir, the private thought the drill instructor said whatever. He never refers to, to first people in the, uh, I guess, the first person. He always refers to him in the third person, I, I think is what it's called. Right. And he, he, he would never, ever be caught dead saying, sir, I thought anything. In foreman, that's, that's, that's stuck into their heads. Every time a recruit says I, the drill instructor will immediately correct that and tell him that he is wrong. And I dreamed of Saint Benedict, father of Western civilization, who in the 6th century founded the modern monastery. For him, man is no longer the living statue of antiquity, but a moving machine in the rhythm of time. The clock beats the time of life in the monastery, and man becomes the peace worker of God. An old Trappist monk says of St. Benedict, Er hat das Kloster als einen uh, Gesamt, Gesamtbegriff aufgepasst. He saw the monastery Und, uh, as a totality. Dann, uh, die Notwendigkeit hatte dann uh, zum Chorgebet. That included the need for communal prayer, study, and manual labor as a means of survival, of course. Und dann aber auch sich eine gewisse Sinn But also with a kind of penance, yet not as slavery, but as a way to fulfill life, as a fulfillment of life through work. Betrachtet, aber eine, eine Art, die das Leben erfüllt, eine Erfüllung auch des Lebens durch die Arbeit. Und wer uh, zum Beispiel auch nicht fähig war, and if someone was intellectually not very able, he even gave him work on Sundays, a small task. That shows that he saw in labor a value as such for man. Man starts to see himself as a machine now, as a mill. He must keep himself perpetually busy. Idleness is the enemy of the soul, says St. Benedict, and orders ora et labora, pray and work. He who does not work shall not eat, the citizens soon add, and burn a V for vagrant on the beggar's foreheads. Since only by labor and pain can the man of the past be crucified, the common good be promoted, one's own desire be restrained, God's punishment be accepted, and the flesh be subject to the spirit, one may well say that the commandment to work incorporates all other commandments, says the reformer Venzo Link in 1523. We build workhouses now, labor camps and prisons, or kill the idlers off. Under Henry VIII alone, 72,000 beggars, vagrants, and poor are put to death. We discover our second nature, the mechanics of the body, and subject the first to it. In another area in which Bentham's ideas remain of importance is his theory of punishment. And one way in which his theory of punishment is worked out in practice 
is the scheme for the Panopticon prison, in which by the arrangement of the architecture of the prison, the business of reform could be carried out and the criminal would be returned to society as a, as a better person. Solitary confinement is particularly educational. For such a lonely confinement, says Bentham, especially if combined with darkness and little food, is nothing but torture, but without attracting the hatred that is usually connected with this term. The central concept was the inspection system in which prisoner cells were arranged around in a circle with central inspection from the middle. The prisons were also to be open to the public so that public inspection could take place to make sure there was no um, oppression of the prisoners in, in the prison. The treadmill was also part of Bentham's educational system. The whole purpose of the treadmill was to punish prisoners. It was a hard and laborious task. Six prisoners in the cubicles used to turn this wheel around and around for six hours a day. It would break the spirit of the hardest prisoner. Um, they, used to s they used to stand in the cubicles and slowly turn this wheel. She would go around and they would have to do this for six hours a day. first get there, the drill instructors understand that they're in a completely different environment and they're broken down. It's, they're very vulnerable when they're first brought to boot camp because they feel like they've been stripped of all their, their, their own person and they're, they're just a nobody. They're, they're nothing anymore. And the drill instructor uses that because when they're vulnerable, that's when we can take them and mold them. And the sooner the better. That's why forming is the most important stage of recruit, recruit training to instill that discipline immediately into all those recruits because they have, it's like they open up because they don't know what to do so they look to everyone to see what, what everyone else is doing. And so we have to teach them all at the same time so they start absorbing some of this information. is a person who does voluntarily what he has to do. The auto icon, which can be seen in the South Cloisters of University College London, was planned by Bentham himself uh, to be created when he died. It has two objects, perhaps three. The first is his belief that bodies should be left for dissection after one's death. And this was opposed at the time by popular superstition and by government. And not only did Bentham try and uh, uh, in fact, drafted the Anatomy Act of 1832, which enabled bodies of certain classes of people to be made available for medical dissection. But he left his own body to be dissected by Southwood Smith, a physician 
a friend and an editor of some of, some of his works. Uh, Southwood Smith conducted the dissection in front of uh, Bentham's friends and it was a, a, a mo a, a, an occasion that uh, caused great interest and uh, not a little fear, especially because a great thunderstorm occurred at this time and frightened the audience. The second object reflects Bentham's antagonism towards religion and religious belief. And he was uh, certainly an agnostic, if not an atheist, and th he thought that leaving his body in this way is a way of satirizing religious opinion. And the third uh, reason was to be remembered to his friends in an unusual and somewhat eccentric way. And he thought perhaps even all of his friends would become, have their bodies uh, treated in the, in the same way. Only now, after 1,000 years of education, can man endure the machine within. He has found a new order, and he calls it second nature. He finds it easy now to subject himself to the machine. Discovering some friends of mine, discovering what their real occupation was, uh, which was um, which was actually uh, some sort of secret intelligence, and they used old computers. That then this, this old this, this house they lived in was completely stuffed full of very old computers, you know, and uh, that that idea of old equipment. Um, you know, that, that, that sort of, there's a slight melancholy about old equipment that's had it, you know. But I quite like that about these figures, because they've all done, they've all done something now, they're all scratched and everything, I quite like them like that. You know, and the, the fact that they're all, they've all been built for a purpose. J'essaye la plume maintenant. In my dream, I see a man who perceives himself as just a mechanism, rejecting all feelings, desires, and inexplicable emotions of the soul he maintains. I am the God of reason. I am, for I think. Jeremy Bentham says of the enlightened products of his education, call them soldiers, monks, or even machines. 
As long as they're happy, I don't care. From day one, once that recruit meets his, his senior drill instructor and his drill instructor, from that day one, everybody builds things around that recruit. That recruit analyzes what he sees. And he sees basically a, a machine then. And that machine is basically created around as an example piece to that recruit. So for them 11 weeks, that recruit is looking at a mechanized machine 24 hours a day doing his training. Now that man can perceive the machine within himself, can he dream it? And only when he can dream it, can he build it. And only when he has built it, can he recognize that he is more than a mechanical puppet. about the machine concept is when they're new, when they're, they just arrive at, at recruit training, one of the things that they're taught right away is basic drill movements. Um, drill movements as in uh, marching as a unit from one place to another in rank or in files. They don't know anything about drill when they arrive. So you have to teach them the very basics. Uh, it's like programming a computer. Uh, you can only teach it what you know. It's not gonna know any more than you know. So as you program that platoon or that computer, you have, to teach, you have to teach them step by step on their level. Like the gunny said earlier, you can't go ahead over their heads to where one recruit might understand and the rest wouldn't. So you, you take it slowly, and by the end of recruit training, you can see the finished product of a, a perfectly formed 60-man platoon marching in exact sequence to every command and, and responding as, a, as one unit. I see the old machine of Archimedes and Leonardo die. It dies first in us, for we have projected it out of ourselves into a mechanical world, which we surround ourselves with. Now we begin to free ourselves from it again. For in the reflection of our second nature, we slowly discover a third. You know, making figures, I mean, uh, uh, it's just slightly satirical in parts. But it is also sympathetic. It's a sort of, it's a mixture. In a way, in a way it's just an imitation. But which sometimes is satirical, sometimes is um, is is sympathetic. In other words, I feel sorry for them too. 
selbstverständlich sind auch Maschinen ein Teil der menschlichen Evolution. Machines are, of course, part of human evolution. In the course of our development, biological evolution was supplemented by cultural evolution. Technical evolution, as a part of cultural evolution, has brought man more progress in the last 200 years than in the 20,000 or even 50,000 years before. Add speech and script, which have tremendously increased our information potential. Neo-Darwinism, or the synthetic theory of evolution, as it is usually called, recognized five basic factors of evolution. Two of them, however, are the most important, mutation and selection. According to this theory, accidental mutations are the only source of genetic changes, which then are sifted like peas through a riddle by natural selection. Professor Ferdinand Schmidt was one of the first to discover the new machine in nature. But very few want to listen to his theory of cybernetic evolution. Mutation and selection, also the great sieb, darstellt. Mutation and selection, which represent the great sieb, that these mutations and the organisms who carry them are riddled through, are strictly passive mechanisms. This view is outdated because life means to react actively and not to wait passively for chance. We, as drone instructors, try to make the platoon that we're working with better than a machine if we can. Because a machine by itself usually can't fix itself. If it breaks down or if one piece is gone or broken, it's, it has to wait until they get a replacement. But what we try to instill in the recruits is, as a machine, when one of them breaks down, they keep going. If, if they're in combat, um, in a combat situation, and, a, and say a, a member of their platoon is killed, it doesn't stop. We don't stop. We just fill in the gaps and continue to march. We just continue the, the rotation of the machine. We don't stop when something breaks down. It just fixes itself or it doesn't get fixed. machine is a projection of our brain. It will replace ritual as the memory of man. He's going to remember it a lot longer if you yell at him and, and get in, you know, straight in front of him in his face, rather than if you just say, uh, excuse me, recruit, you know you did something wrong. You, you know you're not supposed to do it that way. He's going to ignore you. Where if, if you jump on him right away and start yelling and screaming and throwing your arms around, it's going to scare him and it's going gonna, it's gonna to stick a picture in his mind of you yelling at him every time he does something wrong. So next time he starts to do something the wrong way, he's going to be scared to death and there's going to be a drill instructor right there breathing, breathing down his back. So he's not going to make the same mistake twice. One of the main purposes of recruit training is not just to train a, a civilian to be a Marine, it's to train Marines to uh, be a, so they're, they're able to withstand the pressures of combat, the stress. That's why drone instructors yell at recruits. That's why we tell them to hurry up when they're moving as fast as they can. That's why we're constantly correcting them, even when they don't do anything wrong, so that the, they're handling the stress. We can see if they can handle the stress. And if they can't handle that stress, then we don't believe that they'll be able to handle it in a combat situation. As 
if they're under fire from an enemy, they if they can't handle a, a person yelling at them or calling them names or something of that sort, then they're not going to be able to handle an enemy shooting at them. They're not going to be able to, to, to conceive it. So that's why we have to be so hard in recruit training. That's why we have to make sure that the machine works. Because if the machine doesn't work, you don't send it off the production line. You have to make sure every part of that machine is going to work when it's put into another machine or when it's worked in a different way. Right, face, that's that that away. Not face, that's the rest of them. Now. Stand up straight. Yeah, I think you see your drill is talking to you. You're going to talk back to him. You understand me? Stand up straight. Get your eyes off me. You no, understand me? From the world. He uh, just want to do whatever you want to do, right? Uh, Who do you think you are? Me, Who do you think the you are? Off me. Get your eyes off me. Headlock shot seat. Stand up straight. Oh, yeah, he's still uh, yeah, You don't want to talk to the drill right now. You just want to look he at you and do your thing, right? You don't want to do what you want to do. You don't want to listen to us. You just want to do whatever you want to do, right? You're just going to do whatever you want to do. Don't even do what we want to do. Just look around. Leave us alone, right? Just, just do your own. Right. Do whatever you want to do, right? Just do your own. You're just thing. your own self, right? Oh yeah, we do whatever you want to do. Back out on the street. I think you should just stand there and stab him now. Knock your back out on the street. Knock your stinking body up right now. Knock your stinking body up. Something like Jackson Stabbs. Oh yeah, just. And now he's straight in the front. And now he's straight in the front. He don't want to be part of the program here. You want to be part of the program, recruit? Don't you just want to be anybody? Huh? What's going to be the problem? You just want to be everybody. He don't want to be a recruit. No, he don't want to be his parents honest. He can't even stand up to look at the The command was right face recruit. Not looking at me. Not eyeballing the area. Right face. That's face and that away. Like the rest of us doing. Look around you recruit. That away. Not this way eyeballing me. In my dream, I saw strange animals that could think and speak. But they were just artificial men. The robots are the artificial gods, who themselves are the robots of the original gods. Man gave them life with electric breath, and they started to live in a moderate way. A man was overcome by feelings of triumph and fear. According to the theory of cybernetic evolution, living organisms function like living computers. They are supercomputers in the true sense of the word. In a stage of development that by far exceeds our technical computers. Technical computers usually are computers with closed programs, which means that they get their program by man, and they cannot exceed this program. There are, however, computers with open programs. And the best example, to use a comparison with a machine, would be chess computers. Chess computers can, after having played a number of games, analyze these games independently and can then recognize their mistakes and eliminate them. They are able to learn and to think in the true sense of the word. Will 
of the new machine think like us, feel like us, be like us. Eventually, I think we will understand all about the brain. It may take hundreds of years, it may take less than that, it may take more than that. But eventually we'll understand the machinery that produces the human mind and we'll be able to build machines like that, perhaps larger, uh, perhaps more specialized, perhaps designed to do other things that are quite different from what people can do. So the future has unlimited possibilities. It's very much like evolution itself. There could be many kinds of animals that have not yet evolved, and there could be computers that do things that we have not yet imagined. Marvin Minsky is considered one of the fathers of artificial intelligence at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Consciousness, as I see it, is not a very complicated phenomenon. Consciousness is the ability of a machine to have a small amount of memory about the states or processes that it used recently, so that uh, it should be quite easy to get that sort of consciousness into a machine when we wish to. the new machine have a soul like us? The brain is the most complicated machine in the universe, as far as we know, in the world. And I think humanists are actually uh, disrespectful when they say that your thoughts come from a soul a little tiny thing that has no structure, I think they are insulting you because your thoughts come from a hundred thousand million cells working in a tremendously sophisticated organization. And that's the thing that we should respect in people. The idea that it comes from a soul is uh, like looking at the frame of a picture and not seeing the picture. In order for a machine to be intelligent, it cannot be built with all its knowledge in one place because then things will get confused. So it is necessary to make large divisions of 
the kinds of things that we do. For example, uh, we have one part of our brain designed for uh, reproduction. We have a part of our brain designed for getting food. We have a part of our brain for defense or for protection. And each of these parts of the brain uh, have different kinds of knowledge in them. What we call emotions is the process in which we switch from using one of these kinds of thinking to another kind of thinking. Now what I'm saying, I think, is that in order to be intelligent, we will have to give the machine several different kinds of thinking, and when it switches from one of those to another, we will say that it is changing emotions. But the emotion is not a very profound thing. I think it's just a switch between different modes of operation. And in order to make a machine smart, we'll probably have to have a certain number of these different divisions. For example, there'll have to be a section. If you imagine a machine trying to solve a mathematical problem, that's one kind of knowledge. But the same machine will have to have some sense of time. It will have to have some sense that if it repeats itself too much, it's wasting time and it's not getting anything done. And so the machine will have to have a sense of boredom and discomfort with certain kinds of thoughts in order to switch to other kinds of thoughts. So I think to make an intelligent machine, you'll probably have to have processes that resemble human excitement and enthusiasm and depression and boredom and uh, intensity and things like that. Uh, I don't believe you can make a machine smart that does everything in exactly the same way. Shunichi Mizuno says, this is the body. Till now the machines had only eccentrical axles. But this robot has shoulder joints. That is a big difference whether a machine has shoulder joints or not. Because if it has shoulder joints, it can dance. Another difference is that this robot has a skull bone. The shape of the skull bone is like that of humans. As for the facial expressions, there is an inner and an outer world, so to speak. Between them is the artificial skin. She expresses a beautiful world. She laughs. Laughing belongs to the beautiful world. She has everything to express beauty. At the moment, she doesn't express pain or anger yet, because I think I don't want to give the puppets a world of anger. The anger has individual differences. I believe puppets should not be programmed with individual differences. This is Kyoko Oginome, a young actress. In one of the rooms of my dream building stands the great glass of Marcel Duchamp, the bride stripped bare by her bachelors, even. Fantasy drafts the first image of the cybernetic wish machine, Freud's apparatus of the psyche as algorithm, the prototype of the modern bachelor machine, born without a woman's help, arch fantasy of man. Machines are friends of man. Machines are machines. The question is, up to which point man will approach the robots? And the issue is also the tenderness of machines. I want to express that machines are very tender and erotic too. I myself have no clear-cut feelings towards robots.
Some people say I'm an artist, but I'm a technician and very aware of it. All machines are female, for they represent, first of all, the fantasies of men. I once built my first Marilyn Monroe. The second one was already a commodity. I started to build her at somebody's order. The first one I made spontaneously. Because I had built the second one according to the wishes of another man, I had different feelings for her than for the first one. Maybe that is a Japanese feeling. I started to build the second one, but during the work I realized that I couldn't make her the way I had imagined her. Marilyn became older and older and got stiff facial expressions. She showed no motivation anymore. Then I gave up trying to finish her. machines are tender. They're love machines building other love machines. The automobile is our favorite love machine. Earlier, when I started to build puppets, I fell in love with them. When working on a puppet, I felt at the beginning that she was standing behind me. Then slowly, she got a real shape. I put makeup on her and gave her motions. Then I felt lonely because she wanted to leave me. I felt great loneliness. But now I'm different. I feel different now. For now, I have a goal. The puppets are part of that goal. But there is more besides the puppets that can fulfill my goal. But I still long to create something beautiful. The speed of evolution, and that can be proved with many examples, has decisively accelerated in the last three billion years. The merry-go-round of evolution turns faster and faster. Bacteria are three billion years old and a good example. They have remained bacteria till today. Man, however, has evolved in only about 40,000 generations from primal man in the last 600,000 years. 
auf der Basis der Theorie der synthetischen Evolution. On the basis of the theory of synthetic evolution, such an acceleration of evolution is incomprehensible, since it is much more difficult to select individual useful mutations from a big gene string like that of humans with 50,000 genes, in comparison to only 5,000 genes of bacteria. This idea is, however, in full agreement with the theory of cybernetic evolution because the power of a computer increases as it stores more and more information. The theory of cybernetic evolution is a brainchild of the age of cybernetics that we have entered. It is therefore the theory of evolution adequate to this epoch. In my dream, I saw how we desired the new machine, in the image of our newly discovered third nature. As a creature that recognizes its inner reality, its irrational side, as equally real as its rationality, that has been formed in the image of a mechanical outer world. very well, uh, their hands are not very flexible yet, and there are many limitations. I think that over the next hundred years, many of these problems will be uh, solved, and robots will have very good hands. There's some nice hands at MIT being invented now, and the robots will become more intelligent as we learn more about how to make smart machines. So I think the important thing is to focus on the difficult problem of how to control the robot and not on the problem of the mechanical design of the muscles and joints because that is something other people can do. In my wish dreams, the machine takes over physical labor and mechanical thinking. It is my servant. In my nightmares, it takes away my job. I am its slave. And this will remain as long as I project my fears and wishes onto the machine. 
But then, this is the only reason why we build machines. So that they fulfill our wishes and drive away our fears. But wishes and fears that are only projected keep returning and they demand new machines. What are the driving motives that run deeper than the desire for profit? Asks NASA director Jesko von Puttkammer. We can find it out best by going back into our past and looking at old myths that once were created by man as an expression of unconscious human motivation. Die Mythen von Daedalus und Icarus, von Wieland, dem Schmied, von Prometheus. The myths of Daedalus and Icarus, of Wieland, the smith, of Prometheus, who brought the fire. There are numerous legends and tales that illustrate a basic human quality. The imperative of growth within man. And we only have to take the time to look at these metaphors. Der Mensch ist ein wachsendes, dynamisches Wesen. Man is a growing, dynamic being. If I take away his dynamics and his growth, civilization will fall, like countless civilizations before, like the Roman Empire and others. In a time when the earth gets more and more populated, when we already talk about population explosion, when we increasingly struggle with environmental problems, Outer space offers a floodgate, an exit to a new world. Not that we want to flee from Earth and leave it in its overpopulated state. But if we want to harmonize our growth with our ecology, we have to develop space travel and space technologies in order to return to Earth by way of space. Take as an example the astronaut that floats in space, like Bruce McCandless did some years ago, when he left Challenger and, as the first man in history, was suspended in the universe, completely separated from Earth, except for the field of gravity. You can read several meanings from this metaphor. One of the interesting things for me is the to me, one of the most interesting is the merging of man and machine into a new being. Consider that without his backpack, without his computer, without his life support system and his spacesuit, the astronaut Bruce McCandless could not have survived and worked there. And equally, the machine on his back and the spacesuit would have been senseless without him. They would have served no purpose. But for the first time, both of these creations, man and machine together, reached a new level and a new ability, which neither man nor machine ever had before. The machine was refined by the presence of man within, and it gave him the qualities of a superior being, an angel-like being, floating in the vacuum, the panorama of the universe and of the earth before his eyes. You can say that here a cybernetic being was born, a fusion of man and machine to climb to a new level. It is a very, very early example, a very, very early rudimentary prototype of future man. If we project this into the future, we can expect man to become more and more dependent on machines and the machine to become more and more conscious, responsible, safe and intelligent, more human-like. We can see this today already in the research of artificial intelligence. We can see how our young people have discovered the computer, how they feel an affinity towards the computer, that a generation ago we felt perhaps towards a pet. 
Many youngsters that I know handle a computer like I handle a dog or a cat. My name is uh, Yik Sang Kuo. I work uh, in Memorial Hospital, Memorial Medical Center of Long Beach. I'm the director of research, and what I'm going to show you today is a demonstration of um, a robot arm that's uh, used for uh, brain surgery. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm going to demonstrate to you that the robot coming out from this nest, and then it would move to a location which is determined by a CAT scan uh, image. And then the neurosurgeon can insert a needle or drill through the guy of the robot. It will end precisely at the spot inside the brain. Uh, let me start showing you how the robot come out from its nest. The robot is moving into the position that was predetermined by the uh, neurosurgeons. And then a drill will be applied through the guy, and later on will be a needle. As you can see, the drill bit goes over there, uh, over the skull. And this is the size of the hole that we are drilling. It's 3.2 millimeters, about one eighth of an inch. The uh, neurosurgeon does not have to do uh, calculations and uh, adjust this uh, 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 head frame manually uh, by changing different numbers and things like this and the whole space is empty when we don't need the robot the robot can go to its nest and the robot can repeat to the same point within 0.05 millimeter uh, that's what, the re what we call repeatability that's the precision of this robot uh, let me show you it comes back to its nest back to his nest exactly. I can ask him to come out. He's going back to the same point. This is what we call the robotic assisted uh, steel tactic brain surgery. Uh, we are currently working on putting implants and we are currently also working on uh, spine. People with uh, having a lower back pain problem so uh, and also biopsies of the body so this robot although it's small it can cover body and head it's important to understand that there are two views of responsibility one is the religious view which is not mechanical which has some mysterious idea that people can make decisions without any reason I think that is uh, foolish but it's valuable for social purposes. On the practical side, if you have a learning machine, and if that learning machine is designed so that it will tend to do things for which it's rewarded and avoid things for which it's punished, then we have a practical basis of responsibility. And resp you decide that something is responsible only if it can learn from being punished or by being rewarded. And if we make machines that learn in that way, then it will be useful to uh, pretend or to regard them as being responsible. It's true that the law does not regard itself as a teaching instrument, and religion does not regard itself as a teaching machine, but they both are. And uh, the fact that a social institution does not understand its evolution is quite understandable. If religious people knew that their churches were simply cr practical systems for keeping order, then they would stop believing it. If the lawyers believed that they were merely an educational device, they would have no self-respect. So our greatest institutions are built on illusions, and that's necessary, and that's the human condition.
I think in some ways illusions are necessary because, for example, the way the human brain works is very complicated. When we think, we are using billions of brain cells in many different ways. If we took the time to understand that, if we knew how to understand it, whenever, then whenever we think, it would take a year to say each sentence. And so it is necessary to replace the truth, whether we know it or not, by a very simplified myth. And I think that will also be true for machines. When we finally build an intelligent machine, uh, it will probably uh, spontaneously claim that it is an individual and that it's responsible and it has its own ideas. And I think perhaps it will say, I certainly am not a machine, I am more a machine. Because I think that illusion is necessary to make thought efficient. Three, two, one, go. Only in my dream did I understand why the most important impulses of our technological development are irrational enterprises, namely the military and space travel. The most precious are our fantasies. Wish machines and fear machines are the prototypes of all our machines. Man kann durchaus projizieren, dass eines Tages der Computer direkt in das menschliche Nervensystem eingeschaltet wird. We can very well project that one day computers will be directly connected to the human nervous system, so that we don't need the detour of hands and eyes anymore. For example, we will be able to add memory, artificial chips, to give us greater brain capacity by just plugging in additional computers directly into the nervous system and by unplugging them when we don't need them. The uh, robot is a mobile security vehicle uh, fitted with a number of sensors for such things as intruder detection. It will detect an intruder in a facility, uh, smoke and fire detection, and can be fitted with uh, other sensors for hazardous gases, uh, things of that nature that you would want to be warned about in any facility. Uh, it patrols autonomously. Uh, it's battery powered. It will go for up to 14 hours on a full charge of its battery, so it can patrol continuously for 14 hours at a time. Uh, one application that will be coming up in the very near future is in the prisons for use in less secure areas, uh, where, such as day rooms and cafeterias, uh, workshops, where prisoners are not supposed to be at night. It will patrol those areas in place of a human guard and if a prisoner is in those areas on an unauthorized basis, it will call the guard to that area. Uh, they could then come in force, bring a number of guards down, and return the prisoner to his cell. of the new machine is spontaneous man who leaves all mechanical thinking and working to the machine but we cling to the mechanism it gives us order we fear disorder more than death and so we work in order to find order Generally, whenever there's something new, there is a great deal of fear about it, and that will never go away, but they will fear different things at different times. And uh, the fear is valuable because that's what stabilizes a society and prevents it from changing too fast and making serious mistakes. 
So I think there should always be fear of new things. Uh, perhaps a society, a human culture, can only tolerate a few new ideas each generation. And if it accepted too many uh, without testing them, uh, surely many of them would be disastrous. So I think it's good to have people who do not want us to build artificial intelligence. And uh, if they think that it's uh, sacrilegious to do that, or if they think it's dangerous to do that, or if they think it's foolish and wasteful to do that, it doesn't matter. The important thing is we must have people in each society to prevent change, or else the things will change too fast and uh, something bad will happen. The old machine man dies with the old machine. But he dies slowly and reluctantly. Desperately, he clings to the apparatus. He's afraid of the new freedom. conspiracies, scapegoats, and sacrifices. The machine must kill so we can live. But the machine has grown too strong. It kills everybody now, indiscriminately. When we, auch in einer Welt des Friedens, if, in a world of peace, we need an enemy substitute, because as humans we love the challenge, the struggle, because we strive for new frontiers, because we don't want to live like passive sheep, then the unknown of space can replace the enemy. Together, as Americans, Soviets, Europeans, and other nations, we can consider the unknown of space not necessarily as an enemy, but as an intellectual challenge. Bashing each other's heads seems increasingly senseless from an astronaut's point of view. And that is an additional effect that space travel and space exploration have, that the necessity of small states, of borders, of fences, of the whole fragmentation that we unfortunately have on this earth seem increasingly senseless and naive. This overview effect will help us all to see space as a substitute for war.
have to understand on the scale of evolution that humans are a temporary thing. We have only evolved recently. It's less than one million years that there have been animals like people. Uh, five million years ago, there were things perhaps like chimpanzees and uh, gorillas, but uh, humans are new and they're still evolving rather rapidly. They have many bugs. And I think the thing that really makes me fear is if we stay just as we are, uh, then I have no confidence that the human race is wise enough to uh, preserve itself for very long. And I think it would be a great shame if all the intelligent life disappeared and the planet had to start evolving all over again. Another million years and humans, if they survive, will have uh, better brains and they will have removed some of the bugs that they have now and will be more stable. But then if we think about a hundred million years, we should be very different then too. And I suspect that uh, in a certain time when we understand how the minds work, then people will uh, come to the understanding that it is not necessary to be sick. It is not necessary to to lose your memory when you get old, it is not necessary to die because you can take all of the elements of your personality and build them into another body, a machine body, that can be maintained and can grow continually so that uh, we will not have to live with our limitations forever. This is what Faust understood and of course he was wrong in that case because he was dealing with the devil. Uh, but I think when we're dealing with machines, uh, it is a little bit more neutral and the possibilities are more promising. Probably there will soon be machines with consciousness but there will never be a machine with self-awareness. There is no meta-language to program such a machine because the language of self-awareness is already the highest level of any humanly possible language. In five billion years, the sun will grow very large and hot and will burn everything on the earth. So we have only 5,000 million years to find a better uh, place to go and a way to change so that we can survive these disasters. For all we know, in the same amount of time, our galaxy itself will become a dangerous black hole with a quasar. And so uh, we have only perhaps five or 10 billion years left before we must leave not just this star, but this galaxy. and. Uh, we will have to change our form to take those long journeys through interstellar space. Our technology develops between fears and wishes. Both belong together. Both are forever part of our dreams. Maybe one day we'll learn to reconcile them both within us. That's the hardest. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go! Ah. Oh dear. <laughs> they all have a reed in the top here. Mm -hmm. And this is a, it's a solenoid that makes the beak open. And this one as well, I mean, they, they, all, they, all, they all just open their mouths. They all have teeth. <laughs> They're very old now, you know. They need new lungs, new heads. The rest of it is quite solid.
our machine descendants are just as much our product as our children, and perhaps more. Because you see, your children are not your creation. Your children are the children of the dinosaurs, not of you, in a genetic sense. Uh, you're only the medium. But the robots are really your children if you help to make them, and you should feel closer to them than to other animals, because you're more responsible for them. Heidi Uitz. Mike McMahon. Are you ready to one, go? 